Okay, testing one, two, three. You guys can hear still? Good, not a deaf audience. And that would make my presentation a little bit harder. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everybody to Social Engineering. If you can't beat them, join them. Uh, my name is Nathan Cooper, a recent graduate, like last year, from Brigham Young University, uh, Masters of Information Systems. Now, uh, full disclosure, I'm sure I'm not the smartest person in the room, so if you've got input and I'm just like way out in left field, uh, go ahead, raise your hand or, or yell at me or something, we'll, we'll get you a mic. Uh, if I'm just slightly off, uh, maybe like a foul or a short, you know, pun something, uh, go ahead and just let it slide and then come correct me afterwards. But uh, also, if you've got a pillow, you might, you know, you might enjoy that. Also, if you've got a pillow, actually, come up and talk to me because I might need it for my 4 o'clock presentation, which is on PCI compliance. So, uh, when, when I was young, I really liked magic. And I think it is Arthur Clarke, he had his third rule of futuristic technology or something, was that any technology uh, sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable from magic. And I think that in few places is that more relevant than in uh, security and uh, the hacking sphere. Because if you don't understand ARP, then ARP poisoning is essentially magic to you. And most things of security are like that. When I was about 10, I think, my uncle sent me a box in the mail that said, don't open this, there's a bomb in it. And had some instructions taped to the outside. What it actually was is a lock picking set with some cutout locks. And he didn't want me to like, you know, send the springs and like pins and tumblers everywhere. Uh, so he wanted me to read the instructions first. But from that moment, I was kind of hooked on security. And then in college and in you know, middle school, I got into teaching as well and thought that was awesome. Uh, social engineering kind of emerged late uh, in my education, but I thought that it was a perfect blend of business or people skills and technology. So we're going to be talking a little bit, just briefly, about what social engineering is and what are, th what are these methods that we can use to kind of protect against it. So this is a definition that I believe I blatantly ripped off from somebody, but it's uh, the art of manipulating someone into doing something that they would not normally do. And oftentimes we see you know, social engineers as these black hats or, or very persuasive people who get you to give up your passwords and money and, and children. Um, but there's actually a lot of people who are social engineers considered uh, by this definition. You have therapists, you have health or weight fitness instructors, uh, parents, teachers, all of these people are utilizing the exact same talents and skills as social engineers to get us to do things that we might not otherwise do. Now, what enables them to have such interesting control over our lives? There are actually built into our, built into our genomes, um, our DNA, these vulnerabilities. You might say that they are, uh, we are an operating system and we really don't have patches actually for these vulnerabilities. We can become more educated about them, we can mitigate them, but there's not a whole lot that we can do right now for them. And which is good because some of these, like a, a desire to help, is not necessarily something that you want to patch, even though it seems like some people we may have known managed to patch it. Uh, so a desire to help, we have this inborn um, desire to uplift people, make their lives easier. It gives us little warm fuzzies and endorphins all around. But hackers can use that to their advantage in order to make uh, our lives more difficult. For example, this is a quote that I got from InfoSec today. It says, the easiest way to gain access to a building is to show up at the employee entrance carrying four boxes of Krispy Kremes. Not only will you not be asked any questions about who you are and why you're there, but the questions will generally revolve around what floor are you going to? And people will hold the door open, let you pass security doors, everything. It, it's absolutely fantastic. And you can see how that might get used uh, against, us, against us. So uh, also, a habit of accepting visual authority. There was a very famous study done like, I don't know, 30 years ago or something, where people came into a room, they, they were coached by a person who was conducting the study into causing electrical shocks to occur in somebody in another room. And ultimately, the idea was they wanted to see how many people would actually shock the person to death. Uh, what, there's lots and lots of gold nuggets to come out of that study. But one of the ones that I find particularly interesting is the fact that there was a major correlation 
in how likely somebody was to die in the other room, you know, this fictitious person, and whether or not the person conducting the study was wearing a lab coat. These visual symbols of authority really get to us and they cause an innate reaction that make us want to just, I don't know, submit essentially to whatever that person is asking. Uh, I was playing around with the idea of having somebody else come up here, you know, it, with or without a uniform and then have me come up and do a confrontation uh, just so you guys get an idea of the uncomfortable level of emotion that arises when we see these, uh, these authority symbols questioned or um, contradicted. So tendency to trust. Utah Valley, actually Utah in general, has a fraud problem, a major fraud problem. It's one of the reasons that the FBI has a regional center here. Uh, and the reason is because we, we like each other and we really want to trust each other. And, and I don't mean uh, con artists like uh, you, you might find uh, in the movies where some, some, some guy shows up out of the blue, uh, offers to hand off all of his Nigerian gold to you uh, for some, some meager amount uh, in a relation. But rather, you know, these are friends and family, and we really want to trust them, even to degrees that would be quite unreasonable. Um, and unfortunately, it's just kind of it's built into us uh, to do that. Now, psychological minimization is probably one of my favorite ones, uh, if for nothing else, because I get to reference this dancing pig. But uh, it's the effect of taking a problem or a risk and uh, making it smaller, making it less important, making it less threatening. This is all you, yourself, doing, even though the risk is towards you. You do all of this because it is convenient and uh, because that risk or the threat is getting in the way of you doing your everyday job, such as watching the dancing pigs. BYU conducted a study where they had a bunch of students looking at various uh, graphics and live action pictures of Batman and the students were supposed to pick between the two. Unbeknownst to them, they were actually doing a security study where they would uh, occasionally do an SSL injection and cause uh, one of the browser's you know, alarms to go off and show them the big certificate warning. And after the students had clicked through that a number of times, then they actually took over the web page and uh, displayed a very aggressive uh, warning that said, hey, all of your all of your data is belong to us, and we've deleted it as well. And a lot of the students just like panicked. They slapped their laptops closed because it was actually their own data, their own laptops that the study was using. And <clears throat> the reason that they ignored all of those warnings is because they got in the way. They were bad timing as well. But ultimately, we all do these types of things. Uh, the last one is risk compensation. It's based on the principle that the safer a system is perceived, the more humans indulge in risky behavior, keeping the overall risk constant. Even worse, our perceptions are overly optimistic in most cases, meaning that we participate in abnormally risky behavior because we think, oh, I've got this shiny new lock. Uh, that means I'm secure, right? And so we tend to overcompensate and do more risky things. I mean, how many people have had the thought uh, after installing you know, brand new state-of-the-art antivirus and anti-malware uh, you know, I could probably go you know, ignore this warning or do this or that because I've got this other mitigating factor behind it. So, what is a social engineering program? Uh, what is it that we can use in order to help protect employees, coworkers, uh, those people uh, whose security we care about? So, you're probably all familiar with a vulnerability scanner, a network vulnerability scanner. There's lots of companies that have made a really, really, really pretty pretty penny off of these, but essentially what they do is they sit in a position of power in, or um, yeah, they sit in a position of power on your network and are able to monitor the traffic. They're also able to reach out and perform uh, scans or probes. In some cases they're just checking for versions that are known to be vulnerable, but in other cases they actually perform the attack and see how the various nodes within the environment react to that. And then they take that information, uh, you might, you'd usually consider that low-hanging fruit to an actual human who can perform the rest of the triage and then perform the mitigation. So again, we have scanning, monitoring, remediation, and retesting. Now, a social engineering scanner uh, aims to do a very, very similar thing where you're going to actually perform an attack, monitor the results of that attack, 
train the individuals, again, we're talking about people now, train them about that attack, that's the remediation, and then retest. So that you can take something that looks like, like this, kind of a very technical infrastructure, and begin to see your company also as something like this, where you have people behind those nodes. Because all the secure software, all the patch systems in the world are not going to protect you from your own employees who are just happy to click anything that comes their way. Unfortunately, that's just you know, how the world works. So why is that worth your attention? First off, data breaches are really expensive. And it turns out social engineering is a large component of about a third of them. So if, uh, if we were able to come out and offer a magical solution to reduce all attacks by about a third, everybody would be way excited about that. Uh, you end up paying for forensics investigation. If, you're, if it's uh, PCI data, you end up having fines related with that. Also, thereafter, PCI is really expensive because you have to act like a level one merchant. And you have a loss of consumer confidence, which, while difficult to measure, is considerable. Uh, in almost all cases, I was reading something about how uh, small and medium businesses that experience a large security breach typically go out of business within about six months. Uh, now, exactly why that is and how many would have gone out of business anyway is difficult to say. But needless to say, security breaches are bad. The way that we approach social engineering today is unfortunately from a highly technical uh, point of view. We typically spend almost all of our time worrying about computers uh, and whether or not they're patched. While in the background, uh, this kind of stuff goes on where an attacker can simply use a very non-technical uh, method of intrusion and completely own all of our data. Now, in response to that, because obviously nobody, nobody's looking at that and saying it's not a problem, but this is what we do. We train them and we give them trite phrases like, don't click on things, so that uh, because that's really going to stick with them and help them in their daily job. And I promise, I know, I've said that exactly. Um, but if you didn't know, or you couldn't tell, that's broken. So how do you implement one of these programs? Every, yeah, hopefully, I've convinced you to the point where you you actually want to implement one of these uh, at your company or your I don't know your home teaching your kids how to not click on things, uh, that sort of stuff. Planning is great. You must plan. In fact, I'm going to stress it a lot. You need to plan. Because if you don't have a plan, you're going to fumble a lot. You're going to miss a lot of things and generally give up after about two days uh, is what I've seen with some of the companies I've worked with and some of the security experts I've worked with. But planning is not enough you're going to need to implement. And you're going to want to impl implement very carefully, but implementation, again, is not enough. You're going to need to test. Again, that testing is of utmost importance because uh, any infrastructure professionals here know you cannot just you know, set your work out into the wild and hope, cross your fingers, that it's going to be OK, and that all of the security rules are in place, because that just it doesn't happen. It's like writing source code and then giving it to somebody hoping it's going to compile. Uh, a good program, uh, just as a preface here, should have quantifiable results. So you're going to be working probably with business people in getting budget and time in order to implement something like this. Because uh, while, s while vulnerability scanners have been out there for a long time, social engineering scanners uh, have not. And so you're going to need to get, you're going to have to do a little bit more legwork to get buy off. A part of that is going to be showing what the results are going to look like and how you're going to give them back to the business people. So we're going to need to sell it in business terms, implement it, monitor, improve, and then provide training and uh, reports. So selling it in business terms, again, I'm kind of a child of two worlds. Like I said, I really enjoy the technical aspect of hacking, and I love all the cool technology that's involved in that. However, I really, really like business, and I like business people, and um, teaching, all that stuff. So I, I kind of get in the mix here where uh, I end up speaking both languages. So if you guys have questions, please let me know. But if I say something that's completely off the wall, um, have a little faith in me. I 
probably not as completely absurd as you think. Anyway, so sell it in business terms, you need to have numbers. Uh, show the business impact of a data breach. Uh, uh, earlier in the keynotes, they talked about several different security reports that are done on a yearly basis that have really, really good numbers. But generally, if you were to come in and just drop down something even as simple as $200 per breach in America, that is going to turn, sorry, $200 per record affected in a breach is going to turn heads, especially for like SaaS offerings, which potentially have millions of records in there. Um, show that people are the biggest vulnerability in the system. Really make it real. What would it take, I ask people, what would it take to convince employee number X to open up and execute an application that they received an email? And if the answer is not a whole lot, you've got a good case going for you already. Make it not a theoretical vulnerability. Uh, you never want to walk into a business meeting and say, well, there's this chance that this could happen. Instead, you can probably walk in darn well assured that it already has happened. And you probably didn't even find out about it. Uh, if you don't have any cases within your own company where it's happened, you don't have to walk around and look very far to find really good case studies online where other people have, uh, have fallen to it. Even very well-respected security firms occasionally have these problems. And present a solution. You can't go into a business meeting without a solution, especially if you're going to drop any kind of technical words, because they're going to want uh, they're going to want to know the solution, or they're going to want to know what your suggestion is, because they're frankly going to be relatively clueless about it. They're going to go back to the well. Can't we provide more trainings? And you need to have an answer for why that doesn't necessarily work very well. So, profit, and by that I mean go to work. Start small. You don't want to send out 200 plus emails to your company uh, with phishing attachments and stuff as your first try. Um, I've seen that, and that was not pretty. Uh, oftentimes, uh, I, in one instance, I actually saw where a single person ended up getting 500, you know, sorry, 200 plus emails uh, as an individual. That wasn't very pretty either because he wasn't the only one in the organization. Send it to yourself. Start with yourself, as with most good things. See if it works on you. I mean, obviously, you're not going to be fooled by your own scam. But at least make sure that the, well, I, I can't say that for sure. But hopefully, you're not fooled by your own scam. And just make sure that it works from a technical perspective and that you kind of worked out all the kinks. Um, as, a, as a bit of side research, there are several companies that have applications like this. I'm going to uh, mention a couple at the end. But you don't have to build this from scratch by yourself. Also, talk with management. This is sometimes embarrassing. Don't go and perform a wide-scale attack on your company or even a small-scale attack on your company without definite approval. Uh, anybody who's been in the vulnerability testing or pen test environment knows that there's a process to go through before you start doing things. You don't just show up on somebody's step and hand them a report that says you're vulnerable in X, Y, and Z way because they're likely not going to be very happy about it. Uh, I had one instance where I kind of messed up on this. I had gotten upper management approval, but I ended up using the email account, or I spoofed the email account of the middle manager. And after the attack, he, he kind of confided in to me that he felt a little bit violated and that he hadn't been informed about this and that I had completely scammed his employees. He wasn't actually included in the attack. Um, but it took us a little while to come on to good terms again. And management, if you're on bad terms with them, can make your life pretty darn difficult. Anyway, improve and monitor. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways to do this, but essentially just, just check on it. Don't let something like this just go out into the wild and get distracted on other things. Generally, you want these social engineering engagements to be fairly short-term but frequent. Uh, that way, you can definitely put a stop to them, especially if you're using something like a, a call home malware. You don't want that just bouncing around the internet forever. Uh, as an interesting side note, there are, there are companies that will do this for you, uh, that will actually social engineer on the phone and stuff, uh, but they tend to be kind of expensive. One of, another option you might consider is a hacker exchange project. Uh, where you can get with one of your buddies who works for, perhaps for a different company and, and kind of essentially swap roles. Where you attack their company, they attack yours. Everything's covered under NDA. 
this is a kind of a more difficult thing to self-management, so make sure that you've got a, a lot of good reasons why to do that. But that would be significantly cheaper for you. Again, trainer, pardon me while I compare us all to dogs, but these four points um, are very good for training humans as well. Positive reinforcement, don't intimidate them. Don't rely on fear. Don't belittle anybody. Uh, understand where they're coming from and really try and live in their shoes because they're not security experts. Uh, they have a day job uh, just like you and it, it is very, very much different from yours probably. I already mentioned reports. Um, what else is there? There's some really good books that you can read. Uh, these are two from Chris Hadnagy that I particularly enjoyed and of course Kevin Mitnick has done some wonderful work as well. Uh, these are the companies that I mentioned I would uh, cover. There, uh, the first one that I saw was Wombat Security. Um, I think like two years ago they ended up suing FishMe, which was a younger company uh, for intellectual property infringement. That got settled out of courts. And then another one, oh sorry, I got that backwards. Fishline sued FishMe. And then I think just this year, uh, FishMe actually sued Wombat Security for the same sort of thing. So it's kind of like, like a little wrong round robin of um, lawsuits going there. There's also, of course, set uh, for my master's project, I created one called CAF. There's a framework you could build additional things on. So um, if you want more information on that, you can talk to me. But there are, there are tools out there to help you. Please don't reinvent the wheel. Again, social engin engineering toolkit. Uh, make sure you're familiar if you're going to be doing anything with phishing. You're familiar with SPF, DKIM, and DMARC. Uh, because those are important. The first phishing experience that I did actually relied on the fact that uh, the company's SPF records were incorrect, and so I was able to do a very convincing spoof uh, of certain management individuals. Finally, questions, complaints. Uh, did I not smile enough or look to the left or right? That light's really bright though, so don't expect it. Please. So the question is, how during this training do you make sure that you don't uh, raise tensions in between yourself and the employees? And that is absolutely fantastic. Uh, thank you for asking that question because I actually wanted to cover that and must have skipped over it. So uh, again, one of, one of the engagements that I did, it was on a team of four. And we got three of the four people within the first four hours, I think. Uh, we, we stole their Google credentials. Um, <clears throat> one of the individuals was really put out. And I was trying to be as soft as I possibly could on, uh, on the kind of debrief portion of that during the training module. I showed them everything that I did. I showed them how I protected their credentials. Ultimately, I forced them to change their password and use, or use yeah, just their password. But uh, one of the individuals was actually really put off, even so. You want to focus on the positive. Don't belittle them. Again, I cannot stress that enough. Don't laugh at them. Don't if possible, try not to even make jokes about them, you know, even with your buddies in uh, the security department because they're just people. They're doing the best they can, just like you. Some people are going to get offended and you can't completely protect against that. Uh, they'd get offended if a real hacker did it and it'd be way tons worse. So, in my opinion, it's better to drop the shoe now rather than let somebody else do it. Anyone else? Please. What do you mean? Oh, okay, so physical penetration tests. Um, I don't personally, not very much, especially not for my own company because that uh, defeat much of the purpose. I do periodically walk around and check whether doors are locked. I do walk around and make sure that people have locked their laptops. And uh, I don't know, one of the funny little things that I've done is run excise and then um, I close that off, disown the process so that uh, it takes them a little bit of work to get the googly eyes off their screen. That just is my friendly little reminder that they didn't lock their laptop. Sometimes I'll send emails to them from their own address. But uh, ultimately, I don't focus too much on that yet. It's a place where I would like to do more, but I just don't have the time. Uh, there's another question over here somewhere. Yeah, back there.
No, 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 good question. So the question is, how do you protect your own family? Uh, very, we, most of the talk has been about business. So um, the information systems department where I studied, actually a, a couple of the capstones revolved around uh, creating, a, a, creating a site that educated people about common security hygiene. And it was actually geared for a very wide age range. So those types of resources do exist, I know. I can't remember the name of it right off the top of my head, so I apologize. Uh, but I would look on the internet for things that are specifically geared, geared towards kids. Also, have the same sort of, le not lectures, but you know, kind of have meetings with them. Uh, if, you, if you meet with your family on Mondays, then spend some time talking about good safety practices. Uh, as do it with your spouses, too, because you know, while you are a security expert, you know, they might not be. But definitely do spend some time because uh, I've I've heard quite a diff quite a few stories of people that I know who have been hit by like ransomware and stuff, and that's always sad. I want to get rid of that. That's about all we've got. Again, thank you guys for the questions and thank you for having me here. I had a lot of fun. Hopefully, you learned something that you find valuable.